Okay. Okay. It's good to be with you this morning. Welcome to Foundation Church. My name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I am actually just returning from a, from a work trip for the last uh, 12 days and, and flew in on Friday morning and it's still incredibly jet lagged. So if I kind of you know, fall asleep on the pulpit or something like that, you know what's going on? This is a jet lagged time. I forgot my belt this morning. So I'm like pulling my pants up all the time. It's not been pretty. It's not been pretty. This is a scramble to get here. So I hope you guys are well. I hope uh, you were blessed by Pastor Jeff last week, continuing this, this, our series in the Gospel of Mark. Um, Part of um, what I'm trying to do today is actually not continue in the Gospel of Mark because I really did want to bring kind of a report back uh, to you about what God's doing around the world, about what God is doing um, through, through the continent of Europe, actually. I, I was able to spend some time in, in Sheffield, which is, is a town uh, in, in the United Kingdom in England, and then I was able to spend some time in the Czech Republic, uh, in, uh, in Prague, actually, uh, at the Acts 29, which is a church planning network, and SOMA, which is a church planning network, at their joint conference uh, over there in Europe, uh, Western and Eastern Europe, uh, together at the same time. And I just wanted to, to let you know, like, God is at work, right? Um, Europe is an incredibly, incredibly kind of post-religion, post-Christianity um, nations uh, as well as a continent. There's, there's just, there's no kind of, if I talk to people here in the US and I say church, people still have in their minds an idea of what church is because they probably grew up going to church or their grandma went to church. Whereas if I say church to somebody in Europe, more than likely they have zero recollection of ever being in a church, understanding what church is. And the most churchy thing that they probably do is at Christmas time sing Christmas carols. Like that's where the nation, England, that's where England is at, that's where the continent Europe is at, and that's why it's extremely important for us to pay attention to what God is doing around the world, because here's the thing, more than likely, with the way the culture here in the US is going, with the way the culture in the West is going, we will be there in not too, not too long a time. We will be uh, talking to people, maybe in 10 years' time, maybe 15 years' time, who have no recollection of what church is. No recollection of even just uh, the semblance of Christianity in society. And so we need to learn, we need to see what's going on coming down kind of the cultural highway towards us so that we can begin to prepare ourselves. It doesn't make us freak out. We don't get, you know, don't, don't get worried. We don't think that God is off his throne. But no, we just need to understand, okay, if that is where we will end up as a nation, as a culture in maybe 10 years time, then let's prepare for it now. See, let's learn from what God is doing. Let's learn from what cultures are doing around the world so that we as a people, we as God's people, can be prepared to raise up leaders, to raise our children up in a way that they are able to be strong in the faith and able to engage with the culture in a way that brings glory to Jesus Christ. And so if you've got a Bible, um, we're going to be bouncing around a little bit today, but open it up to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 42. But I'm going to pray for us as we get ourselves there. Father, thank you for your love and your grace to your people. Thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Father, I just pray that today that you would show us yourself. You would show your glory off. You would show your magnificence off to us as your people. Father, I just pray that today that you would encourage us that we'd be encouraged by your word, we'd be encouraged by what you call us to as a church, what you call us to as a people. And Father, I just pray that as we, as your people, begin to faithfully and continue to faithfully engage with all that is around us, that you would give us favor, that you would pour your grace out upon us, and that we would see many people come to faith as a result of your love through us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Like I was telling you, I just returned from 12 days away and it was extremely exhausting. Um, I wasn't really, really sure what I was going to expect um, while I was away. We got to spend some time at a church called The Crowded House, uh, which is in Sheffield in the, in the UK. Uh, and and they, they are an incredibly, incredibly uh, impressive church, not because of anything that they've done, not because of anything that, that's going on, but just because of what God is doing in them. And the, the beautiful thing about being away with, with this church, being away with this people, is that uh, it really encouraged me for us. Is a Foundation Church, we are, we are really new. We're a new church. We're, 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 we started in January. We really did. We really started in January. In a lot of ways, we're established, but in a lot of ways, we're extremely, extremely new. And what was encouraging to me is that what the Crowded House have been doing for about 15 years now, 
um, they're beginning to see some maturity in the people that have been a part of this church. And I'm just super excited for us is because we're kind of facing in the same direction that, that they are. We're kind of trying to do a lot of the same things that they're doing. But God has just kind of used, used what, what he's been doing in and through the Crowded House Church to encourage me that what we're doing here at Foundation, what we're striving for here is a good and godly thing. And that as he continues to mature us and grow us, that we will get to see some amazing things happen here. So... Um, the whole idea of me going away on this trip was to learn and to be trained and to kind of see what God's doing. Um, but, but the whole idea was, was discipleship, uh, healthy disciples. Here's the thing, if you're a Christian, you're a disciple because you've been made a disciple because Jesus, you follow Jesus now. And so it was the whole idea of how do we do healthy discipleship? How do we take, have older people in the church, encourage younger people? How do younger people in the church encourage the older people? How do we lead and create healthy discipleship communities where people are being cared for and poured into by people in the community? And then how do we as a church kind of focus ourselves on how we disciple one another, how we engage with one another, how we challenge one another, and how we care for one another? And so the whole idea of doing this discipleship communities, this discipleship kind of focus within a church is that we might become a healthy, gospel-centered, biblical church. And so if you're at Acts 2, this is what we get to see here in Acts 2. Is this is the early church, but this is the picture of what the early church is doing with one another. And it's a biblical picture of what the church is. The church as the people of God, as individual Christians coming together together are being the church. And so if you're in, in Acts 2, let's read from verse 42 through 40, 40, 47. It says, And they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possession and possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is a beautiful picture of what the church is. The church is the people of God. The church is the person sitting next to you. The church is the gathering of Christian brothers and sisters together. And this is what they do. They devote themselves to teaching. They devote themselves to praying. They devote themselves to seeing that everyone who sits in the church with them, that nobody would have any need. Because if one person has been blessed and the other person has a need, that blessed person should just help out with that need. So they, it says here they have everything in common. So this is not like communism where you're told what you need and given what you need by the government. No, no, this is the church where everyone cares about one another. This is a family where people care about the people who sit next to them in the pews, the people who they eat with, the people who they live their lives with. See, this is what the church is to be. This is what the community of God's people are to look like. Now, when I was away, I got to spend time at two churches. And so one of them I already told you about is Crowded House. And the other one was actually a church in Prague. It stood for over 1,000 years, over 1,000 years. Like, it's changed, obviously, over 1,000 years. But, like, imagine that. Like, just, just think. Like, 1,000 years. That's a long time. And this church has stood there for a thousand years. And it was spectacular. So this, this is, I'll, I'll get the guys to put the picture up. This is a cathedral in Prague. I mean, this is, this thing here was built kind of in, in over a thousand years. It's obviously been added to, has been destroyed a couple of times. But this is a spectacular church. I mean, look at that. Look at the architecture. Look at how magnificent that is. I mean, I don't know how tall those, um, those steeples are, but they're multiple, multiple stories tall. This thing is ginormous, absolutely beyond belief. All of those windows that you see there are stained glass. They're not just windows that let light in. No, they're windows that have sta like stained glass. And so from the inside, they tell a story. They're spectacular. Go to the next photo. And this is the inside. I mean, I wish I could have captured it in another way so you could see, but like this is just this giant, giant room. 
that you just walk in and your eyes are drawn upward, that you really see how magnificent God is and how huge He is, all of this light just pouring in to this church. It's spectacular, beyond spectacular. I mean, if you walked in there, you would be blown away by just how huge and magnificent and ornate and everything that's going on within this church. Now, it's not really a church. It's a building. It's spectacular. It's a spectacular building. But you want to know what? The people of God aren't there. So it's not even a church. It's just a really, really nice building. That's all it is. It's all that that is, this spectacular building that has stood for a thousand years that once housed the people of God, now is a tourist attraction. I was telling you about how we need to learn from what's going on in Europe. Churches are now tourist attractions. Buildings are now just simply tourist attractions because the people of God do not gather there anymore. There is no teaching, breaking of bread, prayers. There's no awe. People don't have everything in common. There's no love. There's no grace. There's no Holy Spirit. There's no Jesus. There's no Father, even though they're depicted on the walls. The people of God do not live there anymore. Now, the second church, Crowded House Church, bring the next picture up. Not a very spectacular building at all. Now, it stood there for about 100 years. Um, it's kind of been renovated a few times. Uh, it's kind of right in the middle of a, of a kind of dirty little downtown area. Um, it's not very big. I mean, you'd fit about 100 people in there comfortably. That's about it. Go to the next picture. Yeah, you know, just, just a guy teaching. But you want to know what? This church here is a church. You know why? Because the building contains the people of God. It contains Christians. It contains life. It contains people who love one another, who care about one another. It contains people who teach, people who rebuke, people who exhort. They come around one another and they administer the sacraments to one another. People are baptized in here. People come to faith in this building. So the Holy Spirit is present in this place because the people of God who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit are present in that place. It's a church. It's a church. Now, it is not spectacular. It's actually fairly unassuming. You could walk by it every day on your way to work and you wouldn't even know that it was a church. But inside that building, there is something special going on. There's something sincere going on. Because this group of people, a fairly unassuming bunch of students, baristas, doctors, nurses, stay-at-home mums, businessmen, businesswomen, just normal people, they show up there every Sunday and they sing the praises of the King. And then they scatter and they spend life living with one another in community, caring about one another, knowing one another, being known by one another throughout the week. That's the church. See, that's the church. See, the church is not this spectacular building. The church is not spectacular programs. The church is not spectacular media. The church is not spectacular graphic design. The church is not spectacular anything. The church is the sincere people of God living life together, loving one another, caring for one another, as we have been loved and cared for by Jesus Christ. That's the church. That's the church. You ask me why one big takeaway? One big takeaway from going and spending all this time in this incredibly historic locations with crazy things that have gone on over the centuries, I come away with one big idea. The church is the people of God. And the people of God are to love one another, care for one another, as we have been loved loved and cared for by Jesus Christ. You see, the church is not spectacular. The church is is in every way sincere. As that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, God knows we are sincere. And I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. See, Paul, in this letter to the Corinthian church, 
is very much opposing those who would go around telling people how spectacular and how awesome their ministry is. He says there are a bunch of people who are so enamored and so absolutely captivated by the prettiness of church, by the spectacularness of their ministry, by the numbers, by, by all that they're doing, by, by all of kind of you know, the, the, the ways that they're able to, uh, to advertise and tell people how great they are and how slick everything is. A bunch of people who would love to tell you how awesome their ministry is based on factors that only measure the outside. There are a bunch of people who would love to tell you how awesome their church is because it looks like the cathedral. But there's nothing going on in their hearts. There's no sincerity to them. And Paul very clearly here just says, you know, I want you to be proud of us, not because we're spectacular, but because we're sincere. Because we're sincere. And friends, that's what I want for us. I don't want to be spectacular. Spectacular is just like an empty, empty room. Sure, on the outside it might look spectacular, on the outside it might be great, but if it's empty and it's got no substance... And ultimately, if we're a church that doesn't have a substance and doesn't have a people within it, doesn't have a people who love one another, doesn't have a people who care for one another, doesn't have a people who have things in common, who, care, who, who provide for the needs of those who are within our ministry, who are within our church, then we really don't have a church at all. So we need to be a sincere, loving people. We need to be a sincere church whose hearts are deeply moved by the love that Christ has for us and are deeply moved to love and care for one another. See, Paul commends to the Corinthian church his sincerity. See, the church is not spectacular because of what we do. It is sincere because of who we are. It's not spectacular because of what we do. It's sincere because of who we are. Because at the root of being the church is a changed heart. It's a heart in which Christ now indwells through his Holy Spirit. It's a heart that wants to serve Jesus all of its days. It's a heart who loves what Jesus loves. And let me tell you what Jesus loves. He loves his church. He loves his people. As he died so that he would draw a people to himself, to whom he could reveal his glory and through whom his glory would be revealed to the world. See, there's nothing wrong with having good systems, with having good graphic design, with having good communications, with having a nice looking building. No, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But if that's what you're measuring church by, you're measuring church by the wrong thing. If you're measuring the health of a church based on how awesome it is at telling people it's awesome, then you've got not a church, but probably just a nice little business structure. Friends, if we can be a church that is, does sincerity first, that at the root of who we are is a sincere people, a people who are, have concern for one another, who live with things in common, with to devote ourselves to learning about Christ, to praying to Christ, then we're well on our way to becoming spectacular. But if you put the cart before the horse and want to have a church that's got all of its communications dialed, all of its beautiful pictures dialed, everything is shiny and bright on the outside, but ultimately on the inside we're dead, then, then, then this is probably not the church for you. See, we're going to be a sincere church. So we're focusing on being a sincere church, a church that loves, a church that cares. You see, there's no such thing as being an individual Christian and not being a part of the church. You see, you as a Christian are a part of the church not because you are the church individually, but because you are the church in relationship with other Christians. Now, let me explain that a little bit. You see, I am a son because I have a father. Is that my relationship with my father defines my sonship? is that my son has a father, and he is, he is a son because in relationship with me, I am his father. He is my son. You are a part of the church because you have relationship with other Christians. Because there's no such thing as an individual Christian being the church. So friends, if you want to be the church, you need to be the church in relationship with other Christians. 
is there's no such thing as a Robinson Crusoe Christian. I say that a lot. But you cannot be alone and be the church. Is that you need to be the church in relationship with other believers. So my question to you is, are you in relationship with other believers? Do you live life in relationship with other believers? Do you love other believers? Do they love you? Do they care about you? Do you share things with them? One of the most impactful things I heard while I was away was the guy said, if you're a Christian and if you're a part of the church, it will have an impact on your fridge. It's like, yeah, it will. Like, it should impact your fridge. So you want to do like a little quick litmus test? Like, am I living in community? Am I known? Am I loved? Am I a part of the church? When was the last time somebody took something out of my fridge and felt entitled to it in the best possible way of feeling entitled? Because this thing, we have things in common. We care about one another. That doesn't deny like private property ownership or it's your car. No, but like, you know, if it's your car, you see it as a gift that God's given you to be able to bless other people with. If it's your fridge, your food, the blessing that God's poured out on you, you get to go and bless other people with that. You get to have people over, you get to enjoy meals together, you get to enjoy being one another. This is not a task that we're like, oh no. This is a joy. This is a joy. We have to be with the people of God. It brings you life. It brings you joy. It should make you happy. It's because you get to be the church. You get to be God's called out ones. I came up with a, with a quick little list of what a sincere church looks like. Here's the thing. Don't be downhearted if you're like, well, you know what? We've got some, we've got some, some ways to go because we do have some ways to go. We do really need to, need to kind of figure a lot of this stuff out. We do need to grow together as God's people. We're a young church, and we will. We will grow together. We will develop these things together. So don't be disheartened if you read this list or you hear this list and you're like, oh, wow, I don't have that, or I'm not experiencing that. Let it, let it be an encouragement to you that, hey, if, even if you desire to have these things, even if you feel kind of conviction from the Holy Spirit that we're not doing these things as a church, let it be an encouragement and a conviction to you to be a part of somebody who creates this, who creates this culture, who doesn't go for spectacular, doesn't go, well, like, let's bring in a system, let's bring in a way that we can do that, let's paint the building to make it more beautiful and more, more attractional. No, oh, let's be sincere. Let's sincerely love one another out of the heart that God has given us. So number one, what a sincere church is, is that a sincere church is faithful to the Lord and to one another. We're faithful to one another. Is that God calls us to work and be faithful and diligent in the work of the ministry. And so we, we're faithful. And so we just keep doing it. Is that we might not see a bunch of fruit. We might not see a bunch of kind of crazy things happen. But if we're working for the Lord, we know that our labor is not in vain. And so we can continue to be faithful in the work of the ministry. You continually to be faithful in caring for one another. You can continue to be faithful in the ways that you serve on a Sunday morning, on a Tuesday night, wherever or whatever God has called you to be, or how he's called you to serve here, you can continue to be faithful because you're going to be faithful to the Lord. You're going to be sincerely faithful to him. And then you can be faithful to one another, which means just let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you want to help somebody, help them. If you want to care for somebody, care for them. Just be faithful to people. Because the faithfulness that God has shown us, we can now show to one another. Secondly, a sincere church is steadfast. We're steadfast in the work of gospel ministry. Steadfast in the work of gospel ministry. Gospel ministry is not sexy. Hear me again. Ministry is not sexy. It's just not. It's dirty. You're in, you're in the mess of people's lives. People on their worst days come to the church for help. And that's good. And that's good. People on their hardest days will call you and say, I need you and I need your help. And you just need to be steadfast in the work of the gospel ministry. Is that as we live as the church, as we are sincere with one another, we're not just there for the triumphs, we're there for the failures. We're there with one another when things are tough and things are hard. 
When somebody in your community group has a miscarriage, you're there. When somebody loses a parent, you're there. When somebody gets cancer, you're there. You're steadfast. You stand with them. You're not moved. You're not only there when things are great, you're there when things are bad. Sincere churches are steadfast. They care about each other. They care about one another. And they're there in the bad times as well as the good. When I say a church, I mean you. I mean you. You're there in the bad. You're there in the good. You're there for one another. A sincere church is filled with love. It's filled with love. You want to know why? Because Jesus told us that the world is going to know that we're his disciples by our love for one another. If we bite and devour one another, if we're continually filled with criticism and complaint and carry on because things aren't exactly the way that we like them, then the world's not going to see that we're God's changed, redeemed people called out of darkness into his marvelous light. If we're not marked by love, but are marked by criticism, by, by gossip, by slander, by complaint, then we're not going to be a good church. We're not going to be a sincere church. We're going to be a church that people aren't going to want to come to. If we're a church filled with love, if we have love for one another, if we care for one another, if we love one another out of the abundant love that God has for us, that's incredibly attractional in the most sincere way. We don't want to be spectacular. We want to be sincere. Number four, the sincere church is repenting and forgiving. If we believe that Jesus Christ hung on a cross, suffered and died in our place for all of our sin, past, present, and future, took the weight and the burden of all of our sin upon himself, gave his life for ours, and in exchange gave us his righteousness for our unrighteousness, went into the ground, and rose again in victory over death three days later, then we are free to repent of all of our failings, all of our sin. Repentance is simply turning from it, asking for forgiveness. And we're free to forgive. Because a church, no matter how sincere it is, will sin against one another. We'll do evil to one another. But a sincere church doesn't hide that away. We make much of our repentance. The gift of repentance, the gift of being able to ask for forgiveness and have forgiveness granted by God and by our brothers and sisters, that is a gift. So we will be a church who repents who ask for forgiveness. And when forgiveness is asked for, we should easily be able to grant it because we know that whatever sin our brother or sister has committed against us, we've committed far worse against our Heavenly Father and He has forgiven us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Is that we forgive because we're greatly forgiven. Number five, a sincere church is considerate of one another. We're considerate of one another because we bear one another's burdens. Paul says in Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Is that we're considerate of our brothers and sisters around us. That's why Paul says later on in the the book of Corinthians, he says, uh, if, if one of you brothers struggle with alcohol, then the rest of you who are free to drink, you shouldn't drink around that brother because it could bait him, bait her to fall into sin. So that most means when we consider it with one another, we consider each one amongst us greater than ourselves. Sometimes we'll put aside some of our freedoms so that our brother can flourish, so our sister can flourish. If we're living as a church, we need to be considerate of one another. Now, we're still true to our vision, we're still true to what God has called us to, but we care. And our love causes us to be considerate of the people who sit next to us in the pews on Sunday and who sit next to us in our homes during the week. A sincere church is grace-filled. Grace is simply being given a gift when you should be given punishment. We're grace-filled. So it means we don't hold grudges. If somebody sins against us, we don't wait and, until we can get them. We forgive quickly. We show grace. We give honor 
where we should be giving disrespect. We believe the best about one another. We care about one another. Is that if we are grace-filled, we're sincerely grace-filled. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of a gospel-centered church that is. A church that truly believes that even though we deserve punishment, we're given good things. If we believe that, if we practice that, then we will be a people that stand out. Because we have a culture around us that demands justice. Justice must be done no matter what. Now, grace doesn't mean that consequence doesn't happen. There's consequence for sin. But grace means that justice has already been done on a cross 2,000 years ago so that in the place of justice, we get blessing. And in the place of when we deserve justice, when people have sinned against us, when people have done evil against us, we get to give grace. And it is a gift that you give. And it's a gift that you continually give. And it's a gift that you have been given. A sincere church is in each other's lives. How many people at this church, outside of your family, do you know? How many people in this church, outside of your family, outside of the people you come every single week, do you know? Are you in their life? Do you care about them? Do you know what job they do? Do you know their struggles? You need to be in each other's lives. So we need to be in each other's lives. We need to be known. We need to be loved. We can't do that if we only show up on a Sunday for one hour, one and a half hours, and we kind of shake each other's hands, you know, between the first and the second song. Hey, how you doing? How's the week? How's the wife and kids? It's good. It's good. But if that's where it ends and it doesn't end in, hey, would you like to go out with lunch? Go out for lunch afterwards? Hey, what are you doing this week? I've got tickets to to go and see a movie. You want to come see a movie with me and the family? You want to come hang out? Then it's stopping short. It's stopping short of what we read in Acts 2 is God's design for his church, is that we would be in each other's lives. Which leads to my next point, is that we're known and we're knowing. A sincere church is known and knowing. Is that we are known by people. Not in kind of like a... uh, notorious way, not like the Wild West. It's like, oh, watch out for that guy. No, no, we're known. So we're just simply, people in our lives know us. They know our struggles, they know our pains, they know our weaknesses, they know our strengths. They know the areas that we need to be checked in with, they know the areas in which we struggle, they know the areas in which we're strong. We're known. That way when a need comes up, that way when somebody says, hey, you know what, um, I, I heard of a single mom that needs, needs some work done in her bathroom, you go, well, I know this guy over here is a part of the church who's a plumber, maybe he could come and, come and do this work. Is that we're known, our strengths, our weaknesses, our struggles are known, and we're knowing, which means we know the people around us, we know the people in our church, not just the people in our row, not just the people in our service, but we know the people in our church. And finally, a sincere church is mission-focused. Mission kind of gets thrown around all the time. You know, often, often when we hear mission, we think, oh, overseas missions. Okay, cool, heading to China, heading to Africa, going and kind of preaching the gospel in the streets and then, then hopefully seeing God work things. And that's mission. That absolutely is mission. But mission is local, international, and mission is in our lives no matter what. Is that we are a mission-focused church, a sincere church, is mission focused because you know what? If you sincerely are a Christian, then you have a sincere desire to see the lost one to Christ. You have a sincere desire to see those who are living in darkness be shown light. And that's all the mission is. Mission is simply going out into the community, going out into where we live, into our lives, and engaging with people so that they might come to a knowledge of the truth so that they might get to know who Jesus is, so that they might be granted forgiveness of sins, adoption into the family of God, and being brought into this beautiful, messy thing called the church. The church is mission-focused. A sincere church sincerely desires to see people come to Christ. That's my hope for us. 
You see, we're not there yet. I read these things and now I'll be like, oh, got to get working. Read these things and pray. Pray. Commit yourself to see God work in your heart to empower you to be able to strive to be this church. Sounds so stupid, doesn't it? Because I'm just telling you individually to go and do this. No. Do it as a church. Do it as a community of God's people. Get together with one another and pull this list out and just be like, okay, let's pray together. Let's ask God to work in our midst. Let's ask God to work in our church to be able to grant us these beautiful, beautiful things that we would be a sincere church marked by God's sincere love for us. That we wouldn't be flashy or spectacular for the sake of being flashy or spectacular, but that we would be astounding to the world around us because of our sincerity and of our love for one another, because of our faithfulness, because of our steadfastness, because of our love, because of our forgiveness, because of our consideration, because of our grace, because of our knowledge of each other, because of our focus on seeing the lost come to Christ. Would we be an astoundingly sincere church? You see, God gathers a grace-filled community to achieve his purposes in this world. God gathers normal, unspectacular people. He gathers people who fail. He gathers people who encourage. He gathers people who care. He gathers people to one another so that he might use them mightily to achieve his purposes in this world. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 tells us, Speaking to the church here, you, you church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Foundation Church, this is you. This is you. This is Peter explaining to you who you are. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you were sojourners and exiles far from God's grace, but now you've been gathered under his wing to be his people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So that, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know why God called you and gathered you and turned you into the church? He turned you into the church. He made you the church. He brought you together so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? Jesus. Jesus called you out of darkness. Jesus called you into his marvelous, glorious light. Jesus made you a chosen race. Jesus made you a priesthood. Jesus made you a nation. Jesus turned you into a people for God's possession. And Jesus has shown you mercy. Jesus has called you to be a church. Jesus celebrates the sincerity of your hearts Jesus wants us to be a sincere church so that our mission will be increased, so that people will hear about him, the one in whom the catalyst for us becoming the church is found. You have become the church so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. This is not an individual effort. This is a team effort. This is the effort of the church. You are not the church. I need you to hear this. Individual Christian, you are not the church. You get real Southern on you now. Y'all the church. Y'all the church. Actually, in the Greek, there is this kind of third person like, 
thing that they say, like, you're the church. And like, you might, you might push back on that a little bit and be like, yeah, but, but this one pastor told me that I'm the church. Individually, you're nothing. Because you're not known outside of being a part of the family. So you're not the son without the father and the brothers and the sisters. You're not a sister without having brothers and fathers and mothers. Is that you being a part of the family of God is because God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and all of your life now is not an individual effort but a group effort. A group effort as we are a sincere church, sincerely striving to be known and to know, to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. Church, you are a people. You are a people. You need to live your life with other Christians. You need to be known. If you're not doing that right now, hey, don't hear this as like condemnation, but hear this as an exhortation. You need to get known. And we have places that we do that. We have structures that we can do that, and we call them community groups, and they're nothing spectacular. If you're a community group leader, you know you're not spectacular. <laughs> Honestly, like they're not spectacular because they're just filled with normal people, just normal people who come together and live life together, who confess sin, who tell people, hey, I'm really struggling with work, really struggling with my family, really struggling with what's going on in my life, and the group comes around them and we pray for them and we care for them, is that we make decisions based around one another, which is just insane, is it not? In our Western context, we live in this individual belief, it's all about me and mine and I do whatever the heck I want. Maybe I consult my family. My wife and I recently just bought a house here in Snohomish County. And one of the big factors in us choosing where to live was so that we wouldn't have to move community group. Doesn't that freak you out? Isn't that just silly? We bought a house and one of the big factors was, could we stay with the people that we know and love? Who love us, who care for us? Like, what would it look like if you began to make decisions about your life in relation to the people of God whom you're in community with, who you're known by, who, you're, who know you, who, who you know? What would, that, what would that look like? If when you had to make a big decision, maybe you went to the group and said, hey, we've got this big decision. Would you guys help counsel us on this? Here's the thing, it's not a cult because a cult makes decisions for you. A community makes decisions with regard to one another. Because so nobody's making a decision for you, you're simply making a decision in regard to one another. Because you love one another, because you care for one another, because you're motivated by what Christ has done to draw you and to make you a people. And friends, if you're not in a community group, I exhort you, please, find one. There are like 12 or 13 of them all around the place, all around Snohomish County. Chances are there's one probably within 10 minutes of your house. Would you go and get a part of one of them? Would you become a part of them so that you could be known? Because if you feel like you're out there just doing this thing individualistically, just, just me and Jesus, you're in big trouble. If you think the church is showing up and doing an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, you're selling yourself short. That is a two-dimensional church. Because this is church, absolutely. But you're selling yourself short because God has an extra dimension He's got so much more that he would love for you to be a part of. There's so much more depth and life and joy, tears of joy, tears of pain. Is that you are so much more complex than just showing up here on a Sunday morning and going through the rhythms. God calls you to be a people, a sincere people, a people who love one another, who care about one another, people who care about the needs of those whom they are in relationship with. And friends, we want to create a church. We want to continue as a church where we strive for sincerity as a value, where we see sincerity as a church as the way in which God designed the church to be. God, please, God forbid that we would just focus on being spectacular and forget being sincere. Don't focus on that. It's plastic. It's going to go away. Because what's spectacular today isn't what's spectacular tomorrow. What's sincere today is always sincere tomorrow. Would we go with sincerity and would we let God bring great fruit from that for us?
We have a long road ahead, but it's not one that's absent from God's grace, God's goodness, God's love. Friends, this is my hope for us. This is my hope that God would do something magnificent and glorious amongst us so that we might be his people, he might be our God, and that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your love and your goodness to your people. Thank you that you know us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you have called us out of darkness. Thank you that even though we were once not a people, we are now a people. Thank you that you have made us your people. And Father, I just pray that as we strive to be sincere, as we strive to be your people, that we would love one another with the love that we have received from you, that you would grant us grace and mercy and that we as your people might be able to strive forward with your goodness and your grace. Father, thank you for all that you've done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.